Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Since the new Blade Runner 2049 or 2049 is coming out this week, I decided to review the original Blade Runner. It's a story about an ex police officer named Deckard who was chosen to, as a Blade Runner, to track down replicants who have a four year lifespan on Earth since they came here illegally from a, a colony serving for la slave labor and also Decker was assigned to shoot to kill all replicants and this is of course the four disc collector's edition that I picked up at Ross which is a clothing store as we know it this was back when they used to sell DVDs, Blu-rays and and even VHS tapes, yeah, as well as all the other electronic stuff like headphones, uh, all these uh, CD and DVD cases, you know, so you can hold them to protect, as well as USB ports and all this other stuff, plus clothes and furniture, appliance stuff that you need, yeah, that you can get for a lot less, yeah, that. That's the place, known as Ross Dress for Less. Nowadays they don't sell DVDs, Blu-rays, or even VHS tapes anymore like they used to. And when I got this um, back in 2012, it was $9.99. A lot cheaper than I ever imagined. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Yeah. But it was a very good set to own. Even though there is a 5 disc collector's edition, which I believe it, which is the ultimate edition that came out on Blu-ray as a single case and a silver briefcase, which is the one that they showed in the movie, which you only saw them inside uh, Deckard's room, where they basically have um, all the stuff that they have included. So with all the uh, all the photos and information that they use you know like you have a book inside all this other um, merchandising and, and of course has the movie inside it comes in in different packages uh, one there's one for HD DVD the other one for DVD and the one for Blu-ray too so that was the only way to get it but they did release this on DVD as a 4 disc uh, collector's edition and they even have one for a 2 disc special edition which I believe that's what they used for the final cut which came out in 2007 yeah. and by the way the, the final cut as we speak is a definitive edition of Play Runner where they added um, all the ultra-violent scenes from the international theatrical cuts as well as uh, the removal of the narration that Harrison Ford had to read when he played the role of, of Deckard yeah. and plus they took off the, the happy ending that was inside the movie all of which were from the, the theatrical cut in the US which the theatrical cut didn't have um, all the violence as it was deprecated in the international version so but there is violence in the movie too well anyway um, the first time I saw Blade Runner was back when I was a kid I remember my parents had rented this movie on VHS it was the first time I ever got introduced to a movie after I saw um, several of the films that Harrison Ford did like Witness, uh, Star Wars, all the Star Wars movies and Indiana Jones films as well but the moment when I saw this movie I figured this was different because this movie of course was set in a futuristic Los Angeles that looks quite different than the way Los Angeles looks now 
Yeah. Plus, um, it's also good to see that it's a film noir. It's definitely a futuristic film noir, exactly how, how different it is. So, so chances are you won't be able to see enough action, nor romance, or any of that. Because it does seem rather short, in a way, for a two-hour movie. But I definitely enjoy the characters. Uh, the story does have flaws in it, I'll give you that. The narration was a bit of a distraction. Because I, it definitely wasn't the best that Harrison Ford had ever chose. I mean, he didn't even want to do this in the first place. But he had to do it because the producers uh, had forced him to do it. So it was his job to do so. Plus, it was a trouble production, too, when it came out. I mean, before it got released in, in the U.S., which, sad to say, was underperformed. It didn't do very well at the box office. Mostly because it came out uh, just when E.T. was one of the biggest movies of all time. Same goes with Rocky Free and uh, Poltergeist. Yeah, they all came out. That also explains why John Carpenter's The Fame didn't do very well either. Yeah, so they were having problems. So they weren't so sure if this movie was going to sell very well. Yeah, I think the biggest suggestion was they could have released this in the fall. Like, October would have been a better month for it. Because it's, it's more of a... It's more of a fall release than a summer release. That, that was the problem. So I, I can understand why. And it also let some audience a bit confused, too, and it feels like, you know, this wasn't something they expected from Harrison Ford since he just did Star Wars and uh, Raiders of the Lost Dark, so it's true, so that's why. Plus, Harrison Ford wasn't getting along with um, Sean Young when they shot this movie, and so that probably explains why it really affects the chemistry. And the whole cast didn't get along anyway. And it leads to bigger problems because that's where they started putting all the blame on really Scott. Because since he was the one involved in all this. I mean, even really Scott was having trouble working with him too. I mean, seeing that he acted like... Like he was a jackass and all that. And the fact that even Harrison Ford didn't like working in the rain that much. Yeah, because he would be sick. I mean, yeah, that was the background story that happened. Yeah. Well. But it's hard to believe because over the years, uh, this movie became a cult classic and being on home video many times on Laserdisc, VHS. I mean, the VHS tape was released by Embassy and it would soon become Nelson Entertainment and which then will become New Line Cinema. Yeah, mostly because of the producers uh, behind this movie, uh, Jerry uh, Panchalo and Bud Yorkin, because they were the ones um, that worked for TAT and Tandem Productions from Norman Lear and they fought it would actually help fund the movie, along with Hong Kong producer Sir Run Ron Shaw, uh, along with uh, Alan Ladd Jr.'s production company, The Ladd Company. So they had to put all the money together to help this production work uh, for Warner Brothers uh, to actually uh, fund the, in order for this movie to to have an audience and be able to do very well and market it better too or whatever they can but that certainly wasn't the case so such a shame considering that this was based on a novel by Philip K. Dick called Do Androids Dream of an Electric Sheep so anyway I'm actually going to show uh, the four disc collector's edition that I picked up just to see what it looks like I mean you can see on the back right here where they contain has um, this one with the final cut that's digitally enhanced and improved 
You have a better picture and sound with audio 5.1 surround sound and everything. Uh, this too has the definitive documentary of Blade Runner, which is called Dangerous Days. Yeah, it has um, really Scott and all the rest of the cast, or even has uh, even some directors too, like Guillermo del Toro and and even the <laughs> uh, Frank Darabont joining in the conversation. This free has all free cuts of the movie. And um, which also has not only the theatrical cut, as we remembered, they have the the international theatrical cut, which added more violence into the film, so it's more gory, or well, not too gory, just some it's some intense scenes right there. Um, and then um, there's a, the director's cut that came out in 1992 mostly from the work print that Scott has totally disowned when it premiered uh, back in 1990 that he developed that cut so that way for his own personal uh, appearance right here and I'm going to explain that uh, later on and it also has the enhancement archive on disc 4 so it has everything in there I'm going to try to show you exactly what it looks like. See on the front, the back. The two sides right here. And I'm going to take that one disc out because I put it there just so it can hold better. Um, Here's the free disc that's holding perfectly, as it should be. It's sad to say the, the plong got messed up. Yeah, you can see a tiny plong right there that's missing, so that's what's causing the the fur disc to, uh, to go loose. So that's why I put it together. And I'll show you exactly how the disc is right here on this free, right there. So I'm going to put it back carefully um, on the disc 4 to stack up perfectly so it won't drop, won't have a problem anymore. Yeah. So it'll stay put. And I'm going to put it back to the way it is. <laughs> so here's the movie. Uh, now back to this though. Yes, I first saw this movie on VHS. It was the first movie that got introduced to me after all those movies that Harrison Forehead did with Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And I was very impressed by it. I mean, I, I really started to enjoy the characters. I mean, it did kind of got a little confused at first, but it, I got into it. I loved the music that was done by Bangelis. It had a very wonderful score, and you know, during those scenes alone, it just it makes it more powerful and dramatic, and even uh, very uh, soothing right there. I love that. It just works. It makes it as futuristic as possible, with all the synthesizers mixed in. And I really enjoy the characters too. I I, I love. Um, the cast that they chose, I mean, besides Harrison Ford, I love Sean Yun. I thought she looked very beautiful. She definitely looks exactly like um, like all these 50s uh, femme fatales that we saw. She has that look to it. And you kind of feel sorry for her, too, at, at times. Even though she is basically an experiment. And I also thought that the relationship between Deckard and, and Rachel... Yeah, because that's Sean Young's character, by the way, Rachel. I thought it, it really... I thought it had a romantic relationship. Um, I know it could have done a little bit better, though. I'll give you that. I wish there were more to it. But I, I kind of fell for each other for these two. To me, it just, it just works. 
I can understand why some people think that they had no chemistry together, but I just felt like there could have been more to it. But I thought they were fine. I also love the characters of the replicants, which the leader, of course, is um, Rector Howell. So there you go. Because he was very good in this. So that's where we get to see the monologue at the end. And he wrote it, by the way, too. Uh, Pris, played by Daryl Handa, she was very uh, beautiful too. Very artificial right there. Then you get then there's Zora, another girl. It's also uh, surprisingly sexy though. <laughs> I know. And then of course there's even um, Leon, played by Brian James. Yeah, <laughs> I still never forget that moment when when he was beating the shit out of uh, Deckard. That's where he says the line, Wake up, time to die. <laughs> yeah, still remember that scene. Now, that was actually one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Yeah. Uh, of course, you got Edward James Olmos uh, as Gaff. Yeah, he was. He, he was here and there, you know, just using the Decker to to find out all the clues and everything that happens. Trying to trying to go after the replicants, trying to find out everything what's happening. So, so. and of course you got M. Uh, M. Walsh as uh, Bryant, his supervisor. Ooh. Hired him to uh, track down them. Yeah. And also William Sanderson, too, as, uh, as um, J.F. Sebastian, who, who work as a, uh, a genetic, um, he works as a genetic worker, you know, trying to create all these uh, androids and everything. Yeah, he works with, um, with, with Dr. Edon Terrell, who's played by Joe Turco. And he was very good too. So there you go. So, and I was very fascinated by the way this movie looked. Because uh, the special effects was done by Douglas Trumbull, who actually worked uh, for other sci-fi films such as uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. One of the greatest sci-fi films of all time, no doubt about it. And this is two. <laughs> so it works. So anyway, let's get to the movie. It stars Harrison Ford, Sean Young, Rector Howe, Eric James Omos, M. M. Walsh, Daryl Hannah, William Sanderson, Best known for playing uh, Larry in the TV show New Heart. Yeah, this is... Hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother Daryl. This is my other brother Daryl. Yeah, many others. Brian James, Joe Turco, Joanna Cassidy, James Hahn, and several other stuff too, including Big Trouble in Little China and all that. And Morgan Paul, with two L's. Yeah, it's written by Hampton Fancher and David Peoples, based on the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, and it's directed by Ridley Scott. The movie began set on November of 2019 in Los Angeles, California. We meet an ex-police officer named Rick Deckard, who's played by Harrison Ford, who is just sitting around reading a newspaper and grabbing some noodles at a local restaurant before he was being picked up by an officer named Gaff, who was played by Edward James Olmos, which was hired by his former supervisor, Bryant, who's played by M. Emmett Walsh, who decided to have an assignment for Deckard to track down replicants who are humanoids that came from an off-world uh, colonist which during slave labor they started killing everybody 
and they develop a four-year lifespan. They were all created directly from Tyrell Corporation that was owned by a genius named Dr. Eldon Tyrell, who's played by Joe Turkel. So it's also considered to be a retirement to kill them all. Mostly because they came to Earth illegally just to find more life for themselves. The four replicants are Roy Batty, who's played by Rector Howe, he's the leader of the replicants, along with Zora, who works at a nightclub as a dancer, and uh, she also had the, the snake tattoo, and she dresses up like, like a snake lady, you know, like wearing a, a snake, like a cobra, yep, all these other snakes that she has, the giant ones, like cobras and any, any kind. She's played by Joanna Cassidy. Then there's Pris, who is all alone, you know, trying to look for her friends. She dresses up like a doll, you know, wearing all that makeup and spraying some um, black uh, spray paint all over her eyes like an eyeliner. And she has puffy hair. You know, so she's basically moving around like a doll here and there. And she's played by Daryl Hannah. And we have Leon was a combat uh, replicant who just had a test, an irrigation test called the Boyd Camp, which they're basically assigned by Blade Runner to uh, test out all of of the individuals out there if they're either human or replicants. But of course, Leon actually shot a Blade Runner named Holden, who's played by uh, Morgan Paul. Yeah, which that's what happened too after he was explaining about Leon's mother. Yeah. Well, anyway, which that's what Deckard actually watched the video about about what happened. So Deckard decided to go all the way to Tyrell Corporation under uh, Nexus Six, which um, that's where they had all the models, and that's when. He meets um, a replicant who is an experiment named Rachel, which is basically a femme fatale in a way. She's very beautiful and genetic, and she's played by Sean Young. So anyway, he was assigned to do a test on Rachel to see if... Um, She's either human or just simply a replicant on her own. So yeah, they had to say 20 to 30 questions, but it made it up to 100 or more. So during the investigation, um, he was trying to search, search some clues everywhere around, trying to find and track down all the replicants around each and every apartment and all these other places such as going inside um, the hotel room where Leon stayed and or or even the, where Zora stayed at the apartment and that's when he started taking all the pictures and and some of the pieces that they found at the in the bathtub yeah so they had to um, try to figure out what's going on but then Rachel came just when uh, Decker was uh, on the elevator just going back to his apartment and just so he can have a drink and relax uh, but Rachel basically came in just to see what's going on and he was about to show him the the photos uh, that she has mostly the photo of what's supposed to be her as a little girl with her mother but then Deckard thought that it was just basically Tyrell's nieces 
that part of this was just an implant memory. So he was trying to figure it out uh, for himself, whatever is true or not, compared to the photos that she had to the photos that Leon has. Yeah, they're more phony compared to hers, in a way. So they, he continues to go on. He just uh, went inside um, a local strip club, pretending that he was just one of those uh, typical uh, producers of some sort, and then, then Zora just beats the shit out of him. Just when he was ready to fire, you know, they they had like a chase scene, you know, after he went to the bar and all that. Yeah, because he also uh, made contact with Rachel, you know, so they can have a drink and everything. Since she ran off, um, ran away, and you know, feeling very sad about what happened. Um, anyway, uh, Decker just started chasing after Zora by actually shooting her in the back and she dies then he began to find out uh, from Bryant that there's actually four more because it was supposed to be free yeah because they keep changing everything here and then um, he did spotted uh, Rachel um, on the streets uh, with a huge crowd of people all the way around and that is until Leon came along since he saw the whole thing. And then he was about to talk to uh, Deckard about how old am I. And then that's when he started punching him. And that's when he beats the shit out of him completely. <laughs> Explain to him. And yeah, and in fact, there's even that one scene where he was about to pull out the gun. And then it had a jump cut where he was about to knock it off. So... It, it looks like they must have been doing several takes to that to do that particular shot just right until they got it and it was perfect because I could tell that was an edit right there you know when they did that shot I didn't realize it was an edit when I first saw it but it was really interesting and then that's where we get to that scene that that particular line that I just never forget is when he says wake up time to die and then Rachel had picked up the gun and shot him. Actually saves uh, Deckard's life. Yep, perfect. <laughs> so, but then that's what leads to a lot of questions because we're not so sure if Rachel's going to live this long. I mean, even though she did it all in one. So... A lot of questions have to be resolved right there. So then we get to a story where we get to meet Pris. She was all alone until um, she was being found uh, inside the um, somewhere in a on the somewhere where the trash cans are on the dark alley, where it's being found by uh, J. F. Sebastian, who's a genetic designer very gifted too and he works for Tyrell Corporation with uh, Edon Tyrell and he's played by William Sanderson so uh, basically um, Chris decided to stay in, in at his apartment for a while you know just to keep up and in fact she was waiting for her friend, and that turned out to be Roy Batty, since um, he he just found out that uh, the other uh, replicants had been shot down. And by the way, um, not only that too. Uh, before all this had happened, uh, Roy actually um, met uh, Leon just to uh, explain all the questions and all the answers that they need to resolve when he meets um, a, uh, a genetic um, eye uh, creator by the name of uh, Hannibal Chu who's played by James Hong 
because he was trying to explain the, where Tyrell is and, and J. F. Sebastian, you know, actually uh, torturing him and and uh, by having Leon take off his jacket, yeah, the the one that will keep him warm while he was working on all these genetic eyes that he has inside his laboratory. When Boy uh, was inside the apartment, he was about to ask uh, J. F. Sebastian that. They wanted to go to a Tyrell Corporation to see if maybe he'll help uh, Roy out, as well as Priest, to bring him more life. Well, they tried to do that, but unfortunately, Tyrell refuses and decided that this is just the best thing for him, so... What happens was that after all the questions that he had to be asked, that he's not going to live very long. And yes, because it turns out that that he has uh, Modusula syndrome, which is an aging disorder that's very genetic. That's that causes his life to cut very short. So that means he won't be able to live that long. That maybe even shorter than that might be like possibly a day or so so what happened was because of all this he, he kisses Tyrell and just crushes um, his skull pushes his eyes all the way down from his thumbs kills him completely yeah that very gruesome scene that really got to me so much that it causes Sebastian to be scared off and decided to race all the way into the elevator. And then, then later, uh, Roy wants up in the elevator all alone. So we presume that, yes, he did actually kill Sebastian. So then Deckard had, um, had tried to find out what's happening by going inside Sebastian's apartment. We soon found out that Pris was ready already in disguise is ready to uh, go after Deckard by uh, by doing some flips and and crushing um, Deckard's head or at this rate uh, trying to choke him with her legs you know, almost breaking it completely you know strangling him and then next when she started doing her next uh, backflip, you know, doing all these uh, flip-flops. He shot her completely, and then she was like shaking around like like a little girl completely. Then he shot him again. And then then the, the next battle is between him and Roy. So they battle all the way throughout the entire building. They went outside, they escape. Um, Roy just uh, broke in uh, two of his fingers just when he was about to shoot him. Until he started to fix his fingers. It was very painful. Then they went all the way up to the top of the roof. Then they jumped to the next building. Yeah, he was trying to hang on to uh, the ledge of the uh, the building. He almost fell off, and then Roy somehow jumps to save his life. Picks him up and just puts him down on top of the roof. And that's where we get to hear Roy's monologue. The Tears and Rain monologue, which, believe it or not, though, Rector Howe actually wrote that. Yes, and he definitely wrote it uh, beautifully. It, it really shows uh, what he thinks about what he does and how we imagine what a replicant would do. Very important right there. Until he dies. So Deckard finished the job only to find out that what Gaff said, it's too bad she won't live. But then again, who does? So that's when Deckard uh, finally went back to his apartment to find out 
if he had been inside, and they might have had uh, shot her down. But surprisingly, Rachel was all the way into the bedroom, asleep. She's finally woken up, alive and well. So then the two decided to escape, only to find out at the end that there was a unicorn origami that Gaff had uh, created as a calling card to see what happens. And then they both left the apartment. And then the movie ends. Now, in the theatrical cut, though, we did have the narration. Not the best narration that Harrison Ford had ever provided, because um, it does kind of sound like he came off like an arrogant jackass. Yeah, I can't believe I'm saying that, but to be fair, at least he's trying to explain uh, why for the audience viewers to to understand what's happening in the story. I mean, what's going on. Because usually, in film noirs, like all these Philip Marlowe uh, pirate eye detective stories or any other kind, there's always going to be narration. So that way, it lets the viewers understand what's going on. But sometimes, it's always best to do without the narration because it kind of, it kind of seemed like a big distraction and it kind of hurts it a bit. So, I'm glad they they decided to choose the right route by removing the narration and um, keep it exactly the way it should be. But that's alright. I mean, I, I can understand that. Um, Ford didn't like the idea. And I guess it's... I guess I'm proud of that, that they had to do it. So I can live with it. And I guess I can live without the happy ending. I mean, it, it does show you something different about what's going to happen next so maybe it wasn't needed either but then again I'll be honest with you I didn't mind a happy ending because at least we get to see both Deckard and Rachel together so chances are it even explains that uh, she doesn't have an expiration date so chances are she's going to live anyway so it won't be a four-year lifespan like all the other replicants are. But here's the problem with the director's cut, as well as the final cut as well, um, as well as the final cut, because they're both generally speaking the same, but but with a couple differences here and there. Um, Scott basically wanted to throw in a plot twist in the movie where we be, we begin to zoom that that Deckard isn't human that all this time he was a replicant but we never know that until the final end or at this rate in the middle of the scene where he was just uh, playing the piano all drunk looking at all the photos of what seems to be his mother, I believe so, because I've seen a lot of pictures around, or possibly his wife, I mean, you never know. And then we get to see a scene of a unicorn, which is basically, supposedly, his dream sequence. Like, he actually dreamed that he spotted a unicorn coming by. Like, maybe he might have went from a different land, or maybe... This was just basically an, an implanted memory. To me, that just... I just feel like that just went out of nowhere. It's just acting like, you know, he's just basically a replicant the whole time without even knowing it. And it just makes the story feel completely confused. It kind of insults your intelligence, too. I mean, think about it. It's almost like if... If, uh... <laughs> if he's acting more human than than anybody else. I mean, it doesn't make any sense because I know for the fact that Deckard is a human. Because if he was a replicant, he would be more stronger. Yeah. I mean, he'd be a lot stronger to beat the shit out of everybody. I mean, all the uh, the replicants out there. Because if you saw it, he was being beat up like shit. 
I mean, he was beat up like hell dealing with these replicants. I mean, they were a lot stronger than he is, and he was weaker. And not only that, but he also worked uh, as a police officer the whole time by his uh, supervisor, Bryant. So yes, I mean, he was a police officer for a very long time, so why would he be a replicant? That makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand. I mean, even by then, he probably wouldn't understand what a replicant is until later on. So, I don't get it. I mean, to me, that just that just breaks the story down for me. Yeah, I know people are like saying he's a replicant because, oh yes, because of his eyes. Like, all the replicants have uh, different visions, the way we see it. If they're talking about the scene where we saw uh, Rachel on one side, on the left, and when, then we see him out of focus. I'm sorry, that, that was more of a tactical error than, than uh, what it really is. It, to me, I don't really believe that for a second, so I'm sorry. I'm going to keep it this way. I know it's Scott's opinion. I respect that, but chances are... He's always going to be human. He's always been human. It's going to stay that way. It was like this in the novel. I'm sorry, Scott, but you're totally wrong about that. But that's my opinion. <laughs> and that's his opinion, too. All right, okay, okay. Yeah, and, and plus, you know, how would he even know about these? I mean, even he didn't want to do this. Exactly. So... I don't get it. I mean, he's a lot weaker compared to the, to that. And plus, I don't think uh, the cops alone would never hire a replicant to do the job to kill other replicants. I don't get it. That's that's another thing that bothered me about that. So yes, the story doesn't make any sense. But anyway, back on track. Um, I have seen the cuts alone. After the the theatrical cut, which I saw many times before I got into the director's cut that my dad introduced me to when he gave me the VHS tape and I made a copy later. I watched it and, and I really enjoyed it because they did remove uh, the narration and then you get to hear more of the music so it's not a big distraction. And it sets the tone right. I mean, even though it still has the same aspect story which had a lot of flaws in it granted yeah like there's some problems with the, the action the pacing yeah which is very slow at times and and the relationship between him and and Rachel seemed like it cuts really short it doesn't seem like it clicks together the chemistry but to me, I thought the relationship with Deckard and, and Rachel actually worked. I mean, I wish there were more to it, I'll give you that. But I thought the relationship uh, held the story very well for me, in my opinion. I love the characters, once again. I mean, I thought they played them perfectly. I can live with them, granted. No matter what happens. Um... But it definitely works um, as a film noir, and I would definitely view it as a film noir because when it comes to film noirs, you're not expecting it to be what it is. You're expecting it to be a simple story th that need to be solved with all these mysteries around, all the clues, and all the, the situations that's happening. That's what all these uh, private eye mysteries are. You know, they they've been this way. You know, I I've, I've seen several film noirs and they're actually very interesting. And, and they're not boring. They're actually more um, intriguing and very impressive the way they they handle these stories and all these situations. That's what I want. Especially when it's set in the futuristic world. I mean, because I, I was very impressed by the special effects and all this other stuff that went into it to make it look 
as gritty as possible. Yeah. And um, and speaking of which, uh, I love um, the look of the film with all the um, the holographic uh, billboards that they got, with all these product placements throwing in like Atari, Coca Cola, and you even see a uh, a blimp that has um, an advertisement for Off World, where we begin to see a an Asian girl, and you see a lot of buildings that looks as futuristic as possible. They look a lot different compared to the buildings that you see today for Los Angeles. And then you see what Broadway looks like. I mean, yes, they still maintain the same, but they still. Not only did they still have flying cars and all that, but they also had uh, regular cars as well, the ones that didn't fly. So they move around differently. And then they had a lot of neon lights of all these Japanese and Chinese style feel to it. Like you see Chinatown and, and uh, all these other areas too. It just looks uh, unique beautiful wonderful and of course the score you, you can never forget the score from Bangelis. Yeah, just amazing and I love the actors involved uh, Paris of Ford did a great job playing Deckard exactly as different as we expected from him I love uh, Sean Young she's very beautiful very talented and it really shows uh, I love um, Rector Howe as uh, the leader of the Replicants. Yeah, he was very good. I love his monologue and all his other stuff he, that he's been doing. And he's very strong. I mean, he's actually the perfect villain right there. And I even love Priest. She's very beautiful. Same goes with uh, Zora. She's sexy, too. And Leon. And all the other characters throwing in. Um, yep, I even love M. Ember Walsh, uh, Ever James Almost. Yeah, I, I know he was only there scene after scene, but not very often. But that's okay, he, he was fine. And um, even Joel Turkel as the, the genius behind Tyrell Corporation. Even um, William Satterson. I mean, I, I thought he was great. I mean, compared to his uh, his uh, Larry character in New Heart, he was a lot different here. I kind of feel a little sorry for him, too. First. And it was also great to see James Hahn in the movie, you know, playing a, uh, a genetic uh, scientist who just goes around um, experiencing eyes. I mean, this was his specialty. To create it for all uh, humanoids everywhere. Well, anyway, um, it became one of my favorite films from Ridley Scott. And I really uh, admired it. So, I'm glad to see that it, it got the attention it deserves now. After all these years. And it's been 35 years since this movie came out, so it's interesting. And I'm really happy that it's getting a sequel, but I just hope that it'll turn out for the best. Because it's being directed by Denise Beneuve, and he's been best known for directing Arrival, as well as Sakaro, Prisoners, Enemy, come to mind, those movies. That he's becoming a new theme. For this generation. So I think he'll do justice to the story. I mean, it's great to see Harrison Ford back again. You know, and I'm, I'm hoping this will be the best for him. You know, after Star Wars, so The Force Awakens. And it's good to see that uh, a good actor like uh, Ryan Gosling is, is taking the lead here. So now we get to see another cop. You know, this time working together with Deckard. So, that's cool. So, can't wait to see it. Uh, but anyway, 
definitely check out Blade Runner. No matter how many cuts he's seen, watch it. You'll definitely experience it for yourself, and it'll definitely be a classic. So anyway, I give Blade Runner five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.